All right then, it's time to deep dive on a question no one was actually asking. But by the end of this video, I hope to convince you that it's a far more interesting question than you might first assume. Well, that's my hope. I may or may not succeed. Comment at the end, uh, tell me if I managed to make this interesting or not. Yeah, a video no one's searching for, no one's gonna watch. I am nailing this YouTube thing. <laughs> All right, so the question, who are Rimmers 31? All right, don't go, don't go, don't go. I think I'd better fill in the blanks here and explain. Back in Series 6's episode, Legion, Rimmer, whilst trying to recruit Legion to join the Dwarfers crew, said, In all our travels, travels we've, we've met, met precisely 31 individuals, 3-1, and we've never felt moved to invite a single one to join our crew. True, most of them wanted in some way to suck out our brains. <laughs> or erase us from history altogether. <laughs> Nevertheless, they still weren't what we would consider the right stuff. Now you might be thinking, yeah, fair enough, there must have been at least 31 people, monsters and so on, by Series 6. Yes, there, there was, but here's the big problem. By the time you include all the people in Backwards World, Stasis Leak, Time Slides and more, you can forget 21, the number ends up like two, three times as many. I mean, Meltdown alone had at least 20 characters that the guys directly interacted with. So how on earth did Rimmer get to just 31 individuals, and who could they be? Greetings fellow Dwarfers, welcome to Red Dwarf Nerd, I'm Dan. To work out who Rimmer's 31 individuals were, we first need to work out who they weren't. Or to put it slightly better, we need to know whom Rimmer might have excluded, and why. So let's try to run through the excluded characters in something like episode order as quickly as possible. First up, the cat. He would certainly qualify as the first individual that they met on their journey. However, as we're looking for those not invited to join the crew, I guess he doesn't count. And in exactly the same vein, Crichton can't count towards the 31 either. Additionally, I don't think we need to include different aged versions of the Dwarfers themselves. So for example, they don't need to count an old or a young Lister, as they've already met him before at a different time of his life. And Me Squared's duplicate Rimmer doesn't count, as in theory, it's just a version of Rimmer's mind backup, if you like, that's a few weeks younger than the main one. I'm also not including alternative versions of the main crew, unless they were played by a different actor. So no high and low dwarfers from the episode Demons and Angels, but I have included the female crew from Parallel Universe. All the extra characters in Better Than Life were essentially just computer game NPCs, so they don't count, and Queeg is just Holly in disguise. Now the people they met in Stasis Leak is interesting. You could well argue that they count as people that they met during their travels. However, I think we could easily argue that there were no really new acquaintances going on here, as they'd already knew the crew three million years earlier. Although I suppose I should be including the suitcase, but... We'll skip over that one. And then we get to all the people from Backwards World. These were presumably not counted as they would have put the total right up. I mean, in the fight scene alone, there must have been a dozen individuals on screen at any one time. Now from Rimmer's point of view, it could well be that he's not including all these people because they were not on their space travels when they met them as he and Crichton had decided that they were going to try and attempt to settle down permanently on that strange backwards version of Earth. Or it could just be that following the cat's backwards in the bushes moment, they all agreed never to mention Backwards World to any outsiders. Now Time Slides is also interesting. We met a young Lister, a young Rimmer, Dobbin, Gazza, Uncle Frank and Ficky Holden. But I think these don't count, as they're either just a younger version of the Dwarfers, or they're people that at least one of the Dwarfers had already met in the past. And I guess the skiers don't count because well, nobody said anything to them, they didn't really meet them, interact with them. I'm skipping over the skiers. But you could make an argument for the rich listers Butler Gilbert and Sabrina Maholinger Jones. Should these be included as people they met on their travels? Well, it's very debatable whether any of the dwarfs would have remembered them as the timelines got so skewed up at the end of time slides. So they're an interesting one. If you think they needed including, then there are two characters in my list of 31 that I'm kind of sketchy on, 
So if you want to swap them and include Sabrina Mahollinger Jones and Gilbert, then I think you could swap them in. I'm not including the two trial holograms from Holoship because these are probably old crew that the dwarf was already knew pre-accident. And finally, we get to the really big one, Meltdown's wax droids, which presumably can't count as there were well over 20 droids that the characters were shown to definitely interact with, as well as a few extras like Winnie the Pooh, Al Capone, and of course, James Last, that they saw off in the distance. But given that we're taking Rimmer's point of view on who the 31 are, we need to remember how flippantly Rimmer dismissed the loss of life of all of those wax droids, and I think we can assume he simply never considered them to be proper individuals with proper independent personalities. He just dismissed them so flippantly. Right, so with that entire page of my script concerning who we are not including in my list, finally, we get to my list of 31. I have actually included this list in the description below, so if you want to copy and paste it and amend it and comment below with who your 31 are, then go ahead. Right, so in something like episode order, first person we meet is the Cat Priest from Series 1, Episode 4, Waiting for God. We get the Mayor of Warsaw, who's spontaneously combusted in confidence and paranoia. We, of course, get Lister's confidence and Lister's paranoia from confidence and paranoia. The female versions of the crew, Deb, Arnie, the dog, Hilly, all from the alternative uh, version of Red Dwarf in Parallel Universe. The Polymorph, of course, we've got to include the Polymorph. Hitler from Time Slides. Yes, I am including one of the characters from Time Slides because we know from the reading of the paper that it was definitely confirmed that they met him. There's Hudson Five, of course, from the great episode The Last Day. Camille and Hector, both from the episode Camille. The brilliantly scary and brilliantly tasty curry monster from DNA. The simulant from the episode Justice. What a guy! We've got to include Ace Rimmer from Dimension Jump. And then we get the members of the Hollow Ship crew that we actually saw on screen. Nirvana Crane, Binks, Captain Platini, uh, Natalina Pushkin, and Randy Navarro. Now here we get my two slightly iffy ones that if you don't want to include them, you could swap in uh, Gilbert and Sabrina Hollinger jones We have Justified Lister and Justified Crichton from the episode Inquisitor. These guys were killed off in the episode, but it's so unclear whether anyone would remember them or not. Now we know the Inquisitor himself was remembered, but would they have remembered the um, Justified Crichton and the Justified Lister? Difficult question. So if you want to swap them out with Sabrina Mahalinger jones and Gilbert, I think that's okay. So of course, the Inquisitor himself, we get the unspeakable one from Terraform, as well as the two women who oil up Rimmer. There are a few other people in cloaks, but we never meet them sort of one to one. Then from the episode Quarantine, of course, we get Professor Landstrom. There's the Despair Squid in Back to Reality. And then finally, we're almost there, the two Sirens from the episode Sirens. Now, there may have been more than two Sirens. It's very hard to know if the two that were fighting with Lister and fighting each other on the asteroid, whether they died or not, whether they killed each other by stabbing each other, and whether Lister shooting them with a the bazooka had killed them or not, it's very hard to know, but I think there was at least two. So then, fellow dwarfers, there's my 31, my reasons for including them, and you've heard my reasons for not including some of the others, but give me your 31 down below, or just your one or two people that you think I should swap around. Greetings, fellow dwarfers, explaining the change in Crichton. Welcome to Red Dwarf Nerd, I'm Dan. In today's theory episode, I'm going to try and find an in-universe explanation for the major season 3 change to the look of Crichton. In the brilliant season 3 opener backwards, we meet Crichton for the second time on screen, now played by Robert Llewellyn with the familiar, boxy, metallic-looking Crichton body. But of course he didn't always appear this way. The season 2 episode Crichton saw David Ross play the part, with not only a different face and voice, but also a completely different size and style of body. Season 3's comically hard to read opening crawl gave us a vague, catch-all explanation that, between the seasons, Crichton, the service mechanoid who had left the ship after being rescued from his own crashed vessel, the Nova 5, is found in pieces after his space bike crash lands onto an asteroid. Lister rebuilds the Noid, but he fails to recapture his former personality. Now the brief fails to recapture his former personality explanation is fine for explaining away Crichton's change of voice and personality compared to his season 2 version. Given that it was well established in Body Swap that an individual's voice and personality are directly linked in the Red Dwarf universe. What's happening? What the hell is going on? 
But why would his body be so completely different after Lister's rebuild? Literally every detail's different, and he's even noticeably taller. I think we need to dig a little deeper on this one. Okay, first up, let's quickly establish just what is the baseline, normal appearance for a Series 4000 mechanoid. Unsurprisingly, it's the boxy post-season 3 style. This is made clear in Season 7's Beyond the Joke, where we meet another 4000 series, Abel, who, other than a green paint job, is more or less identical to the Robert Llewellyn Crichton. Or should that be, they're both more or less identical to John Warburton? Later in Season 12's Siliconia, we also meet dozens of other 4000s sharing a similar body and head style to the Robert Llewellyn Crichton. So we can take it that the post-rebuild style Crichton is the norm for a 4000 series droid. So what's going on with this smaller, non-metallic looking faux dinner suited butler version of Crichton with his strange looking face? Well to explain what's happening in this very early episode, we have to come right forward to some of the most recent, including the very most recent, The Promised Land. Here we got to see Crichton in a poor state of repair that we're really not familiar with. He's rusty patched up, his chest monitor's broken, and he's certainly not looking his best. Check out my Promised Land breakdown to find out more details. Crucially, the Promised Land showed us that without servicing, the usually meticulously tidy Crichton can literally start to fall apart at the seams as wear and tear takes its toll. Knowing then that the Season 2 Crichton was alone on the Nova 5 for millennia upon millennia, and knowing now that he does degrade without servicing, it's easy to postulate that the shabby, wrinkly appearance of his face could be due to wear and tear over the years. Sure, the real world explanation was simply that it was early days and the Crichton mask just wasn't as well refined, but as an in-world reason, I think the face deteriorating over the millennia is a good shout. And lastly, the change in his body could be explained in a few different ways. Firstly, given how often the later Crichton seems to have upgraded the design of his body throughout the years, presumably to better suit the requirements of those dangerous deep space missions, having to act as Red Dwarf's part-time sanitation droid and Lister's full-time mum, we could suppose that the butler body may have just been an extremely modified version of a standard body, tweaked over centuries by Crichton himself to suit his fairly singular needs as he acted as butler aboard the crashed Nova 5. Then, when Dave later rebuilt him, he probably just utilised standard 4000 series parts or perhaps even just performed a complete body replacement, putting him back to standard. Alternatively, given that his metal outer parts were shown to rust in the promised land, and, given the astounding amount of time he was stranded aboard the Nova 5, the metallic outer sections could simply have rusted away and needed to be discarded. That shiny looking suit could actually be a patched up and restylized version of what pokes out around the later Crichton's joints. And, as a final possibility, the recent episode Crisis showed us that when available, Crichton can simply swap his body to a different model at will. In the case of Crisis, Crichton swapped to a flashy, gaudy style body just to satisfy his midlife crisis. But I think it's easy to imagine that different bodies could be selected to fulfil specialist roles. Perhaps a tougher body for harsh environments, perhaps one for extremely cold conditions, or perhaps a less metallic, less bulky body for a role like having to act as butler to free wounded crew members for an extended period of time? I actually quite like this complete body swap idea as it keeps with something we've actually seen on screen. But any of the three possibilities seem valid to me. So there you have it fellow Dwarfers. Yes, the boring real world explanation for Crichton's change of body is simply the change of actors, the advancement of the makeup technology and a reimagining of the body design. But I think the change of body can be fairly neatly fitted into an in-universe explanation using the technology, techniques and conventions of Red Dwarf. His voice changed because his personality was lost, his face changed through wear and tear, and his body changed because it had either extensively worn out, been extensively modified, or completely swapped to fit Crichton's Nova 5 duties. Greetings fellow Dwarfers! Lister's guitar is a polymorph? Ok, the theories are getting a little bit strange today, but bear with me, we should have fun with this. Now looking at Lister's guitar over the years, it's abundantly clear to even the least observant that there have been rather a few changes. By my count, there's at least six different guitar models shown throughout the show's run. His acoustic, a Red Explorer type, the Les Paul copy, what looks like a Telecaster, a Strat, and in the Promised Land, a flat-topped matte-finished Les Paul Special. 
with the most obvious switch being from an acoustic to an electric guitar from season 3 onwards. Now, while in the real world this was no doubt merely a stylistic change that went along with Lister's cool, leather-jacketed, more rock and roll costume from season 3, there's never been an in-universe explanation given as to why the guitars changed. Even the Red Dwarf tongue-tied wiki page just speculates that Lister must have owned multiple guitars but never displayed more than one at a time. However, I don't think that explanation works for a few reasons. Firstly, everyone's language about Dave's guitar, including Dave's own language, is always singular. He was going to snap my guitar in half. Your guitar. It's always guitar, never guitars. Another reason I'm not convinced that Lister has multiple guitars was that Lister showed too much care and devotion for just one at a time. Marooned is the most obvious example of this, with Lister going to comical extreme lengths to preserve his guitar and talked about playing that guitar as his one key escape from the monotony of space travel. Sure, that particular guitar might have sentimental value, but would he have spoken like this if he had half a dozen other guitars to use back on Red Dwarf? I kind of doubt it. And lastly, Lister's dad, well, himself, flushed his beloved Les Paul out of Red Dwarf's airlock in Fathers and Sons. Dave rescues it a few episodes later in Siliconia, and during its recovery, we're shown that Lister's been making do with a Van Halen-inspired colander. Not something you'd bother creating and using if you had multiple other real guitars to use. So I'm just not convinced Dave has multiple guitars. I think they're all the same guitar masquerading as one. But how can that be? How can an object change shape seemingly at will? Well, there is a creature within the Red Dwarf universe that does exactly that. I think Lister's guitar is a polymorph. Now, before you all start unsubscribing and giving me hate in the comments below, let me present my case. First up, let's jump to Season 6, Episode 1, Sirens, where Crichton and the cat open fire on a siren holding Lister's guitar. Despite the barrage of close-range laser fire, smoke, sparks and a hard drop on the floor, the guitar is picked up unscathed and instantly played. Now I severely doubt the average Les Paul, let alone an authentic copy, could really withstand gunfire, but a polymorph on the other hand, well that's a different matter. In Emo Hulk Polymorph 2, we get a humorous scene of the cat smashing Lister's guitar. Now it's not the smashing that intrigues me as I'm sure Crichton could easily manage to reassemble any guitar. It's the guitar model that's interesting. That's not a Les Paul. With a scratch plate and a pale neck, it looks more like a Telecaster to me. And this seems logical to me. If you're an emotion-sensing alien who can tell that danger is coming and can sense the anger in the cat about to smash you, then why not switch yourself to a different type of guitar that easily falls apart to make sure you only get banged against a crate once, rather than beaten multiple times over until you fall apart. Just look at Billy Joe Armstrong let loose on a Gibson type guitar. Would you want to be beaten that many times? As for all the other guitar changes throughout the seasons, I could see this just being the polymorph adapting to fit with Lister's changing moods and whims over the years, so that he keeps his guitar always close at hand. So if all these axes are one and the same polymorph illusion, what's this emotion-sucking vampire using for food? Well, how about Lister's talent? But Red Dwarf Nerd, Lister doesn't have any talent, he sucks at guitar. True, but is that because Dave really is completely talentless as a player? Or because every seed of talent within him is being drained by the very instrument he's hoping to express himself with? Think about it. Alone in space for 30 years with very little to pass the time? Is it really conceivable that he couldn't learn at least a few basic chords and a few scales in that time? Well, until recently, we'd no way of knowing, as Lister only ever played his own guitar, but in 2017's Cured, we finally got our first proper look at what Lister is capable of when freed of his beloved, but perhaps talent-consuming, polymorph Les Paul. To jam along with the robot approximation of Hitler, Dave is forced to play a borrowed guitar and actually plays pretty well. Okay, it's not got Steve Vai worried, but hey, it's in tune, it's in time, and nobody is wishing they were deaf. It's a long way from the one chord in the Indling song. As for where the polymorph could have come from, well, that's easy. At the end of the season 3 episode Polymorph, we got a cheeky little tease that there were in fact two polymorphs on board, not just one. The remastered Blu-rays tried to give some daft explanation about the second one living in Dave's sock drawer, but the remastered episodes are about as well-loved and accepted as Rimmer in a bad mood. 
So I think the second polymorph becoming Dave's guitar is a far more welcome explanation. And yes, I know Lister's guitar has changed twice already before the episode Polymorph, but who's to say the second Polymorph wasn't already a bored Red Dwarf long before the one we see prominently in the episode? So there you go. Okay, this theory really is just a bit of fun and shouldn't be taken too seriously, but hey, it kind of gets your thoughts going, it kind of sparks your imagination. And it's a bit daft and it's fun and I enjoyed making this episode and I hope you guys enjoyed watching. Alright, I've got 10 fast theories that might completely change the way you re-watch Red Dwarf in the future. Let's dive in. Number 1. There's a conspiracy because Peterson killed the crew. What's this? Olaf Peterson is shown to be a catering officer aboard Red Dwarf and a complete drunk. Yet, in the very first episode, The End, when Lister is revived and he's walking around the ship and we see the various piles of ashes, Holly tells us that one of them is Olaf Peterson. In the drive room? A catering officer? What on earth is he doing there? That is catering officer Olaf Peterson. <laughs> and why on earth was he not in Rimmer's death video? Could it be that there's some strange conspiracy going on with Olaf Peterson? He should not have been in the drive room, but he was. He should have been in Rimmer's death video, but he wasn't. Is there something going on here? Was he deleted from footage? Was there some cover-up going on? I don't know! But it's a fun little theory to make you think next time you watch it. Second quick thought, all of series eight was in artificial reality? Now I know you could apply this idea to basically any part of Red Dwarf. You could say that as soon as they got the Better Than Life headsets in Series 2, everything that follows could still be in the Better Than Life dream. Okay, I get that idea, but I'm picking on Series 8 in particular for these three reasons. Firstly, the closing shot from Series 7 shows the original style of Red Dwarf, the sort of shorter, fatter style of Red Dwarf ship. But as soon as we get to Series 8 and we see the ships again, it's the long, extended, modernised ship. But it's supposed to be the same moment in time. So what's going on? How has it suddenly changed? Maybe they're in artificial reality and something's shifted in the artificial reality dream. Second point is, when they're on the ship, it's actually mentioned about being in artificial reality. It's a big plot point in the first few episodes of Series 8. And it even establishes the idea of having dreams within dreams, kind of Inception style. So it's like the show is telling us about artificial reality and about dreams which could be a big hint that they're still in one. And thirdly, and this is the most convincing one for me, all of the crew apparently get off of Red Dwarf and escape in Starbucks and Blue Midgets. So all of the crew escape at the end of series eight. But after series eight, we never get a mention of them. But not just that we don't get a mention of them, we still get Lister referred to as the last human or the last human male and needing to continue on the human race. You're the last human being alive with no life, no family, no future, no prospect. The future of the human race is entirely in your, in your well. Why would you put that pressure on him? Why would you still refer to him as like humanity's last chance if there's thousands of other crew members just out there in space somewhere still doing fine and there's men and women and they can have children just fine? Why would you still put that pressure on Lister unless Series 8 never really happened and it was all an artificial reality dream? Just a thought. So theory number three. What if Todd Hunter didn't say ship? Okay, let me explain quickly. Throughout the different series of the show, the crew count has changed from 169 early on to 1,169 later. Then in the books, it's 11,169. So we've got different crew counts usually just getting bigger and bigger. But one of the things we base the early low crew count of 169 on is Todd Hunter's words. In the very first episode, in the very first scene in fact, he says there are 169 people on board this ship. But what if Todd Hunter had just mispronounced and actually meant there are 169 people on board this shift? There are 169 people on board this ship. You, Rimmer, are over one man. Why can't you two get on? Board this ship, you board this ship, you board this ship, you board this ship. That would actually cast things in a completely different light. It would just mean that Zed Shift, with uh, Rimmer, Lister, and others, had 169 people in it, but the total crew count could be a completely different number. 
It's an interesting thought. Perhaps they were on shore leave and not actually on the ship itself, or he just meant like, those people don't count, you're not going to run into them, they're elsewhere on the ship, re relaxing or whatever. What if he'd said shift instead of ship? Okay, number four. Have you ever seen those x-rays that are just inside the medical room when the future echo of Lister comes out holding the babies? Have you ever seen those x-rays and wondered, whose x-rays are those? No, no, you haven't, have you? It's just me that would notice that. Sad Dan over here. Anyhow, I think there's a good possibility that they're actually Lister's own x-rays, but not from the future echo, from three million years earlier. You might just assume that the x-rays are part of the future echo and are showing Lister's tummy to look for the babies inside, but it doesn't look like that to me. I don't see any little children in there. I think more likely they are indeed x-rays of Lister, but they're three million years old x-rays of Lister from back when the crew was still alive and Lister fell in the cargo bay. By the time your safety harness snapped and you fell into the cargo bay. <laughs> Rocked my spine in three places. You laughed. I spent six weeks in traction. Sure, there's a remote possibility that they might be George McIntyre's x-rays. Perhaps the crew wanted to find out why it was he died. But I think more likely they're Lister's x-rays. I think that's kind of a cool little detail. Okay, quick idea number five. Why did Rimmer's mind make him guilty when he went to Justice World, but it made him innocent before the Inquisitor? Hmm. His own mind himself made him guilty in one and kind of innocent and a worthwhile person in the other. Could it be that Crichton did such a good job explaining how, because he's such a half-wit, Rimmer isn't really responsible for the radiation leak? Could it be that Rimmer actually believed him actually believed what Crichton was saying. So five episodes later, his mind has accepted it so much that he sees himself as innocent and a justified, worthwhile person. So was it because of Crichton's lawyer-like defense that Rimmer saw himself as justified? Number six, Rimmer is so superhuman as a hard light hologram that the diamond light version of Rimmer is almost pointless. He's already pretty much superhuman. He can take basically unlimited damage without dying. He can be beaten over the head for long periods of time without losing consciousness. He can turn himself into soft light and pass through walls. And he's already shown himself to be more or less immortal, having lived already over 600 years, thanks to his little stop off on Rimmerworld. He's already pretty superhuman. If it wasn't for his innate cowardice, he could do amazing things, like Ace Rimmer does, if he would just sort of accept the fact that he's already pretty superhuman. I mean, Ace Rimmer kind of proved that the only thing that could really stop him even falling out of a plane didn't do it, was a bullet and some really lucky shot that managed to hit his light bee. But as long as you can protect that light bee, he's pretty much superhuman. So does it make diamond light almost unnecessary? Okay, number seven. Did the 171-year-old future echo of Lister and the future echo of Bexley not just cross a time barrier, did those future echoes cross a reality barrier as well? Does light speed mean you cross realities a little bit? Because it sort of seems like we're not on a path for either of those things to actually come true. I suppose they still could. I suppose that's not impossible, but it seems like maybe they crossed realities and we're seeing different versions of Lister's future. Could future echoes cross the reality barrier? Number eight, has the Inquisitor got droid rot? Has his circuits gone bandit after all those years of learning deep space? It's an interesting question and one that I think needs answering. When you think about it, his whole premise of getting people to judge their own lives and you know yourself, you're judged by yourself, it's the worst system I've ever heard of in my life because you're judged by yourself at your current age, at your current point in life. I could just be having a bad week and think, oh, you're not worthy. I could just be having a bad week. I can't judge my own life until I get to, perhaps until I get to the very end of my life, you know, when I'm 80 odd years old, maybe I can look back on life and judge it as worthy. But at this current point now, I could just be having a bad time. And in fact, you could still be 80 years old and misjudge your life. A murderer could look back on their life and if they felt that that murder was justified, they'd see themselves as being a worthy, justified person. You're the worst person to judge your own life. Case in point, Rimmer judged himself as worthy. 
Number 9. Was Rimmer perfectly justified in trying to be machine president in Macocrity? Ok, we all know that Rimmer would be a terrible machine president, but was he perfectly justified in trying to be? Well, when you think about it, he's a machine. It's not really mentioned in the episode, but he's a machine just as much as Crichton is. In fact, Crichton has some organic parts in his brain, we know that from the episode DNA, whereas Rimmer is totally digital now. It's a computer doing all the thinking for him, which is something that got mentioned by the cat of all people in The Promised Land. You don't decide what you do. The computer in your light bee does all your thinking for you. So it's an interesting thought. Actually, Rimmer was just as justified in trying to be machine president as Crichton was because he's just as much a machine. And number 10, is Lister a secret robotics genius? I think I might have mentioned this once before, but he seems to show an absolutely amazing set of skills with robotics. He fixed his robot goldfish in seconds with just kind of prodding around inside. Maybe not the best example, but he built up the Marilyn Monroe droid. He rebuilt Crichton after he got smashed up with the space bike. He cut Crichton in half and put him back together. He kind of poked and prodded around inside of Crichton's mind. Okay, he blew a load of minds up, but it seems like that wasn't his fault because of the Nega Drive. And just generally, he seems very handy with fixing things and electronics around Red Dwarf and whatnot. He just seems generally quite a gifted guy especially with robotics. Or to quote Captain Hollister, quite bright. Which brings me on to another thought. Is he not just a secret robotics genius? Could he really be secretly related to Joseph Lister? The bouncer in Twentica asked if he was related to Joseph Lister. I wonder if secretly, back in Lister's timeline, maybe he could be. I mean, he doesn't know who his parents were. Okay, we find out later it's his, he's his own father, but still there must be some genetic source somewhere. Maybe one of the sources of his genetics was Joseph Lister, and that's why he's so gifted. Where the laziness comes from, that's a whole other story. Well, there you go, fellow dwarfers. Ten theories in one video. How on earth could Rimmer become Ace Rimmer? Greetings, fellow dwarfers. Today, just a really quick, simple little kind of question, kind of thought, kind of a theory. How on earth could the Series 7 Rimmer, the idiot Rimmer, the chronically inept Rimmer, managed to go off and become Ace Rimmer. Hmm, let's dive in and have a look. Now to recap, in the Series 7 episode, Stoke Me a Clipper, the ultra charming interdimensional hero Ace Rimmer arrives in the familiar Red Dwarf dimension, but he's only got a limited time left to live. Needing to recruit his replacement and with no alternative, it's the chronically cowardice, perpetually pathetic and intolerably idiotic Rimmer BSC SSC that he has to recruit. So after just one brief lesson and one brief staged fight, Rimmer is sent off on his own in the wildfire to go be a hero interdimensionally. So with so little preparation and such a low starting point, how on earth could this pathetic excuse for a man ever hope to take up the mantle of Ace Rimmer and live up to his counterpart? It certainly seems unlikely that Arima could ever overcome his inner coward, stretch beyond his little finger's worth of charisma, or possess more than a pubic louse's worth of charm. Well, I've often wondered on this one, and I kind of just figured maybe he was a no-hoper and he was useless as Ace, and perhaps he was the last Ace Rimmer and kind of killed the line off with him. At least, that's what I was thinking until very recently, when I was invited to be on the Everybody Is Dead Dave podcast with Phil and Adam. And during our conversations, something came up which might change my entire view on Rimmer being ace. We were discussing the well-known luck and sexual magnetism viruses, uh, first seen in the episode Quarantine from Series 5, and later seen in the three-parter Back in the Red from Series 8. Now, while it's the luck virus and the sexual magnetism that are the famous ones, there are two more that we never saw used. Inspiration and Charisma. They were there in the quarantine episode when they found all the viruses, but they didn't seem to be there in the Series 8 episode. And it was Phil that kind of came up with the question, the kind of the thought, hey, maybe the original Rimmer took Inspiration and Charisma when he went off to be Ace. At the time, I said that Phil might have struck gold. This might be a great idea. And the more I thought about it, the more I think, yeah, this could be a brilliant way of explaining things. You see, inspirational and charismatic are certainly two words I would use to describe the proper version of Ace Rimmer. So 
if the idiot version of Rimmer had the foresight to grab the two vials on his way out to be Ace, and then if he gave himself a suitably large dose, that might be enough to make the difference and make him into a great version of Ace Rimmer. When you think about it, he wouldn't necessarily need like the sexual magnetism virus because the charisma would give him, well, the charisma, the charm, to kind of pull women naturally without the need for the dodgy sexual magnetism virus. And the inspiration virus could just inspire him with great ideas that he could use when he's in a jam or when he's facing an opponent, give him great ideas to get out of difficult situations, inspire him, perhaps so. Of course, there is one big obvious stumbling block for this theory, Rimmer is a hologram. So would these viruses even sort of go into Rimmer? Would they have any effect? Fair enough, that could be a big stumbling block. However, we've got to remember, these viruses came from Professor Landstrom, who was a hologram. So I think it's quite conceivable that she would make these viruses so that they're compatible with herself. That's my take on it anyway. Okay, so I don't have much supporting evidence for this. Although, it would explain why, if Rimmer took these in Series 7, it would explain why they weren't in the Crash Starbug in Series 8. It would explain why they're gone. Plus, if it eventually wore off, or if he ran out of all the stuff, Rimmer would start to revert back to his old idiot self, and I think quite possibly, or quite probably, he'd come back to join the crew, which would explain why from Back to Earth onwards, we've got a hard light hologram back on Red Dwarf. Just a thought. So guys, what do you think on this one? It's more of a fun one than a proper hardcore theory, but I think this could explain a lot about how Rimmer, the idiot Rimmer from series seven, could become Ace. What's going on with Rimmer's rank in the promised land? For over 30 years, Rimmer's been stuck at the measly rank of second technician, with the single notable exception of two thirds of an episode in season 11. Yet, in the promised land, Arnold introduces himself to the freshly reloaded Holly, not as a second tech, but as a first technician. I am first technician Arnold J. Rimmer, BSC, SSC. Now in my promised land analysis, I suggested that this could either mean that Arnold somehow got promoted between season 12 and the promised land. Alternatively, it could simply be Arnold lying to try and make himself seem a little more senior to the new Holly. Or far less interestingly, it could just be a simple script error. Well, with the line now committed to screen and part of the primary Red Dwarf canon, we have to ignore the mistake option and find an in-universe explanation. Since my promised land analysis suggesting those three reasons, I've had a number of comments suggesting a few alternative reasons. So let's take a look at a couple of these. One common suggestion was that after resigning his deceitfully attained commission in Officer Rimmer from season 11, Arnold could have perhaps only dropped down as low as first tech instead of second. The problem with this theory is that just a few episodes later in season 12, Arnold calls himself a second tech again. A second technician and acting senior officer on board the JNC. And checking the final season 12 episode, Skipper, we see a full screen written example of Rimmer's rank, right on his private property. In this case, his collection of vintage wires clearly states second technician. And given that this is the man who sewed name labels onto his ship-issued condoms, we can be 100% sure that a new, higher rank would have been updated everywhere, especially his private property. So I reckon we can quite definitively write off the idea of Rimmer demoting himself only as far down as first tech, and be sure that he was indeed still a second tech right up to the end of the final season before the Promised Land. Another suggestion I've received does have some merit. It's the idea that first tech could be a tribute to the book Infinity Welcomes Careful Drivers, where Arnold is a first tech throughout. This one could well be possible, however, it doesn't give us an on-screen, in-universe explanation, so we'll have to keep on going. This leaves only my original two suggestions. Either he got promoted between season 12 and the Promised Land, or he's simply lying to Holly. Now in the Promised Land, when Arnold's introducing himself, we don't get major reactions from the rest of the boys, but we do get some rolling of eyes and slight shaking of heads. 
I'd put these reactions in line with either thinking Rimmer's a goit for lying, or thinking he's a pompous ass for using such a pointlessly long title for himself. So the other guy's reactions don't nail things down any further. However, Holly's reaction does. At this point of the promised land, this isn't the easygoing wheeze of the week, April Fool's gag telling senile Holly we all know and love. This Holly is factory fresh, devoid of humor, anal retentive, and a strict follower of JMC rules. He's also smart, knowing instantly that the Cat and Crytum are not part of the original crew, and that Lister had committed a crime right back in the day three million years earlier. Yet with all that knowledge and fastidious rule following, when Arnold apparently gives the wrong rank, Holly doesn't point out Rimmer's mistake. Logically, this can only be because First Tech is now his correct rank. Yes, far-fetched as it may seem, Rimmer, somehow between the episode Skipper and The Promised Land, has got himself elevated one command point to First Tech. How? I don't know. Why? Smeg knows. But by a logical process of elimination, I think it seems the most likely explanation. And before everyone points out the absence of a senior crew member to dish out promotions, it was stated in Dear Dave that the JMC onboard computer could demote Rimmer. So, in theory, it must also have the power to promote Rimmer. will be demoted to third technician. After all, it had the authority to posthumously give Howard Rimmer a military declaration. So, there we have it, Smeggers. What do you all think? Am I right on it? Or am I right off my rocker? Is using logic and Rimmer in the same sentence about as clever and sane as Sparehead Free? Let me know what you think is most likely in the comments below. All right, here's a simple question that might not have such a simple answer. What year was the promised land set in? Sounds like a really simple question to answer. Promised Land came out in 2020, about 32 years after the first episode, the end. So therefore it's three million years into Red Dwarf's timeline, plus another 32 years. However, the Promised Land itself made a point of mentioning that there are age differences between the cat and his brother Rodin, in that the cat should have been the younger brother, but now appears to be the older one. And in fact, we can see that Ray Faron and Danny John Jules is about 12 years between them. So we've got a 12 year difference. But that doesn't even come close to accounting for the strange time weirdness and time jumps that have happened in Red Dwarf. It's way more than 12 years. Series 6's Siren starts off with a 200 year forward time jump where the guys have been in stasis trying to catch up with Red Dwarf after having lost it after the episode Back to Reality. Then in the Series 7 episode Nanarchy, they're asleep for another 200 years as they're trying to retrace their steps back to the ocean moon where they lost Red Dwarf in Back to Reality. Then in the episode Crisis from series 11, they're asleep for possibly another 100 years or so as they try and find another 4000 series android butler. Okay, Crisis didn't actually give us an exact time that they were asleep, but it certainly looks like a long time and it is implied that it's 100 years as they mention about the Nova 3s being launched 100 or so years before the Nova 5s. So forget 12 years, that's 500 years that the guys have spent just sleeping in stasis. But we could possibly add another 600 years on top for the time that they had to go to Rimmer World through a wormhole. It's a little bit unclear in the episode whether everyone was affected by the time dilation and when they got back to our universe, did they had they just been away for a few hours or had they been away for 600 years? That's unclear, but we could possibly add 600 years, taking our 500 to 1100 years that the guys have lost or gained over the time of the show. And this isn't even starting to account for the stuff that could have happened after the series six finale out of time. So the timeline has got really strange in Red Dwarf by the time of the Promised Land. So Rodin the Feral King being about 12 years younger than his supposedly younger brother, the cat. What the smeg's going on here? Well, I've got a little theory that I think's kind of fun for this one. Remember back to the episode Dimension Jump with the brilliant Ace Rimmer? Ace is told that the dimension jump he's about to do is a one-way trip. There's no coming back. Ace, there's no coming back. And he himself said in the same episode, I can't go back, but there's a billion other realities to explore. I can't go back, but there's a billion other realities to explore. Can't go back. Keep that one in mind. 
because the episode just before The Promised Land, Skipper, had Rimmer skipping from reality to reality, going from one to the other, and then at the end, apparently returning back to his own reality, where he sits down with the guys and plays a game of cards, and they sort of welcome him back on board. Or do they? Or rather, is it really the same crew welcoming him back on board? Remember, jumping from realities for Ace Rimmer is a one-way trip. There was no going back. So does that not apply to the Prime Rimmer as well? Could it be that the dimension or the reality that Rimmer finds himself in at the end of Skipper isn't the one that he left at all? Just one that's extremely similar. Perhaps one where the previous events played out a little bit differently, and instead of being 500 to 1100 years further into the future, they're actually lost about 12 years or so along the way, hence the cat being 12 years younger than his brother. An interesting thought, and it would help explain why it is that Rimmer's rank changed in the Promised Land. I am first technician Arnold J. Rimmer, BSC, SSC. Perhaps it was just that something else played out differently and he did become a first technician. I had my own theories for why that happened, you can check out the video up here, but this could be interesting as well, a different reality with a different rank. Of course, there are plenty of other moments in Red Dwarf where they could have gone back in time and lost those 1100 years or so. Zooming up to light speed in Series 1's Future Echoes springs to mind as a possible cause of a very weird time dilation sort of thing. Plus, who knows where their timelines could have been after Series 6 is out of time. There's also the Time Wand in Series 8, there's Tika to ride, jumping forwards and backwards through time, loads of other possibilities, but Given that The Promised Land is the episode that comes directly after Skipper, I think something happening in Skipper might make a lot of sense. So let me know what you think in the comments down below. Once you start skipping realities, is it impossible to come back? There's an interesting thought. Could Red Dwarf's on-ship prison complex, The Tank, have always been there? Perhaps from the very first episode? Join me for a quick fire theory, where I'll be trying to answer one of those little niggling questions about the small rouge one. Oh, and spoiler alert, I'm going to need your help on this one. Well, greetings fellow Dwarfers. It occurred to me that the prison complex shown in Series 8 could very easily have fitted inside even the very first Series Red Dwarf totally unnoticed, given that the ship has such a ludicrous bulk to it. So that raises the obvious question, was the prison only in Red Dwarf in Series 8? Because the Series 8 version of the ship, the long extended version that was rebuilt by the nanobots to original design plans, was the prison only in that version of Red Dwarf because it was rebuilt to different plans? Or could the prison have been there in all the different versions of the Red Dwarf ship perhaps even from the very first episode. Interesting question, let's look at the arguments for and against. Well, first up, Holly seems to very much make it sound like the prison was always on board, even from the very first episode. He said, speaking to Dave, they call, call it, it the, the tank. tank. There, there was, was an, an inmate, inmate population, population of 400, four. all being transported to Adelphi 12. Presumably, they've all been resurrected too. Resurrected too. So, kind of implying that not only has the original crew been resurrected, but the prisoners were resurrected, which must have meant they were originally alive back in the first episode. So for me, Holly is very much making it sound like the prison was always there at all times, even when Red Dwarf was three million years younger back in our solar system. Another reason it could well have been there is that Hollister didn't include the prison in his list of original design plans alterations that he listed out when he was talking to Dr. Newton. Hollister said, we now have a quark level matter antimatter generator, shipwide bioorganic computer networking, and a karaoke bar on sea deck. Plenty of changes, plenty of fun stuff there, but no mention of the prison complex being a new addition to the ship, further implying that it was always on board. And thirdly, as mentioned, Red Dwarf is just so bonkers big that there's no space limitation or any other physical reason why a prison couldn't be included in every design of the ship and go completely unnoticed. I mean, if you go back and watch my country size ship video, uh, I kind of showed that literally, if you lay out the floors, Red Dwarf's the size of a country. Could you lose a prison inside of a whole country? Yeah, I reckon you could. So that's the arguments for the tank having been there all along. Now let's look at why it might not have been. As mentioned, Holly certainly seems to make it sound like the tank was always there on board. However, 
doubt could be cast upon this, as Holly himself, apart from being senile and a bit strange, Holly himself was also tampered with by the nanobots in Series 7's Epideme. In that episode, Dave, speaking of the nanobots, said, So they fixed your core, core program. program. And then decided they'd be better off without you? Yeah, it was shortly after they'd met me. This could pour doubt upon all of Holly's statements, as if the nanobots could fix his core program, they could also alter his core program. So if the nanobots know they're going to rebuild the ship to original design plans, and let's say the nanobots did add a prison, then they could alter Holly's programming and put in knowledge of a prison. Another reason it might not have been there is that no mention of the radiation leak deaths in any episode ever seems to include the 400 prisoners in the count-up. It's either just the original count of 169 or the later count of 1169. Even episodes after series 8 don't seem to include the prisoners in the count-up. For instance, Rimmer speaking in the series 12 episode Time Wave talks of killing over a thousand people. I mean, take me. Back in the day, I misrepaired a drive plate and killed over a thousand people. Now, in our culture, that sort of thing is really frowned upon. <laughs> but the prisoners would make it not a thousand people, it would be more like over one and a half thousand people. Kind of implying the prisoners weren't there for the radiation leak, so weren't there in the first episode. And lastly, Holly in Back in the Red said that all the officers knew about the tank which would presumably mean that they must have had plenty of mentions of the tank in the confidential files. Something which Lister is heavily implied to be well-versed in. I've seen the crew's files, medical records, sessions with the therapist, the works. Knowledge is power. Who said that? I don't know. Nor do I. <laughs> Yet, he's totally surprised to hear about the tank. I mean, if he's been through the confidential files, surely there must be mention of the prison complex, and might even be mentioned of the prison guards, surely they'd be in the confidential files. Unless of course there wasn't a tank to mention. Remember the confidential files were a disc on Starbug that wasn't rebuilt by the nanobots. So those are the arguments for and against there having been a prison on board during the very first episodes. There certainly seems to be more arguments against it having been there. However, the argument of Holly having been repaired and reprogrammed is admittedly perhaps pushing believability just a little bit. But let me know what you think. I said I'm going to need your help on this one. I can't come up with a definitive answer. So what do you think? Could it have always been there? Or is this just a Series 8 location and a one series wonder? Never present before, never present since. Well, greetings fellow Dwarfers. Today, a look into why we never saw Lister return to the past to marry Kachansky like his five years in the future counterpart did in the episode Stasis Leak. To recap, in the series two episode Stasis Leak, the boys find a portal back three million years to the still inhabited Red Dwarf. Spurred on by a photograph seemingly depicting Dave and Kachansky marrying, Lister tries to track down Kachansky to spend the remaining few weeks together in matrimony. However, towards the end of the episode, it's revealed that it wasn't the present timeline Dave who got to marry Kachansky, at least not yet, it's a version of Dave from five years further into Lister's future. But of course, as we all know, Dave never managed to marry Kachansky after five years, or at this point, even after 30. So what on Titan happened? Well, there's quite a few possible explanations, but most fall into one of two types. You could either see it that the stasis leak portal that they went through didn't just take them back three million years to Red Dwarf, but perhaps it also took them to a different dimension. So everything that we saw in the episode was happening in a different dimension to a different Dave. Or you could even see it that the portal created that dimension when things were perhaps changed in the past. Alternatively, you could take it that one of the many reality-altering scenarios that the guys encounter over the next few years somehow skewed the timeline so much that Dave would never find his way back to marry Kachansky. Think Whitehole, Inquisitor, Time Slides and so on. But I think there's another option, one that stares you in the face every time you watch Stasis League. 
the five years in the future Lister ruined his own future by revealing too much future information to his past self. But Red Dwarf Nerd, he didn't reveal any information. When the younger version of himself asked for advice, he just gave him a silly joke answer. Uh huh, yes. But that very joke answer might be the very thing that ruined everything, as specifically he gave his younger self an instruction, a warning, a paradox inducing premonition. He joked that he shouldn't go to see Run For Your Wife. So what's the, the single most important piece of advice that you can give me? Three years from now you'll go through a cosmic storm and enter a parallel universe. You'll want to go to the theatre, whatever you do. Don't go and see room for your wife. Don't go and see room for your wife. Don't go and see room for your wife. Now, of course, at the time, this seems dumb, particularly as in the episode, it's meant as a joke. But think about it. We get plenty of warnings in later shows about the risks involved in changing things with time travel. Time slides, White Hole, Inquisitor, Out of Time, Tika to Ride all deal with how small changes in the past can destroy the future. So the five years older Lister discouraging his younger self from seeing a stage show could have had a massive effect on Dave's future timeline. It might just seem like a silly insignificant change, but it might have had massive implications. And it might not even have been as small of a change as we all presume. Sure, in the episode it just seems like a joke to have his younger self avoid having to sit through a random stage show that the older one didn't enjoy. But what if that stage show isn't so random? Sure, the real world version of Run For Your Wife on the face of it just seems like a daft, farcical, romantic comedy stage show. But look a little deeper and that real world show is about a bigamist who secretly has two wives who begin to find out about one another kind of like how Lister would become a bigamist if he were to marry Kachansky? Given that, of course, he's still married to his Gelf bride from Emo Hawk Polymorph 2. So sure, the future version of Lister might have disliked the show, but consciously or unconsciously, it could have had a massive effect on his approach to marriage, his understanding of bigamy. In fact, it might have told him everything he needs to know about it for the future. So the younger version being discouraged from seeing the show, it could have really affected any number of his future decisions, leading to some bizarre chain of events where he never ended up traveling back to marry Kachansky. So sure, yes, we could just see it that the stasis leak took him to an alternative reality or created one, or we could see it that all the different time travel events and Different reality events in Red Dwarf over the next few years prevented him from ever finding Kachansky. But I really like this idea that the episode itself gives us the moment that ruins his future and tells us why he never got to end up marrying her. Because he gave himself a little bit of silly advice that ended up ruining his own future. Five times that Rimmer could have been reborn, remade, resurrected within the show into a new flesh and blood body but didn't. Well, greetings fellow Dwarfers, today we're having a look at a little idea I had whilst re-watching some old episodes, particularly Body Swap. Whilst this episode gets a mixed reaction from fans, Body Swap really lays down some interesting theory ideas that Rimmer or anybody could swap their mind within the show into anybody else's body very, very easily it seems. In very little time, all you need is a donor body of almost any description. If it can hold a mind, Rimmer could go into it. Now, no doubt, Rimmer would very much like his body, the replacement body, to be a replica, a clone of his original body. But the episode Body Swap very much establishes the idea that he has such a blast being in a real body, he wouldn't really care and he'll take anyone's. So let's look at five times that he could have done just that. Series 3, Episode 6, The Last Day, Hudson 10's body. In the episode, Hudson 10, the new replacement android that's going to replace Crichton, comes along, but on learning about Silicon Heaven not existing, he has a bit of a meltdown and sort of dies. Could Rimmer have put his mind into that body, into Hudson 10's body? Theoretically, yes, although it's a little bit unclear in the show whether or not he just has a software problem and breaks down, or whether there's some charged circuits and a bit of a hardware issue. It's a little bit unclear, but presuming 
the hardware is good, Rimmer, I suppose, could have put his mind into Hudson 10's body. Mind you, loony Rimmer inside of a body more powerful than the Terminator? Hmm, maybe not such a good idea. Another opportunity could have been in Series 4's Meltdown. At the end of the episode, all of the wax droids are killed. But it is said in the episode that the bad droids were trying to kill Meltdown and remake the good droids to be bad ones. So it seems like even though these guys were killed, they could have been melted down and remade into a new body. Could have been made into a body that's a replica of Arnold's to have his mind put into them. Although I have a suspicion that Arnold simply wouldn't have wanted one of these bodies, given how he just dismissed these guys, treated them as if they weren't sort of really alive, didn't care that loads of them had been killed at the end of the episode, so I very much doubt he would have wanted a wax droid body. Okay, Series 6, Episode 5, Rimmer World. Probably the most obvious example many people will think of. An entire world, an entire planet populated by clones of Rimmer. Every single one of those people, every single one of those bodies, would have been the ideal donor body for Arnold. However, while Arnold, I don't think, would have had many qualms about sticking his mind into one of those bodies, I can imagine Lister and the rest of the crew thinking it was basically murder to just yank someone out their body and stick Arnold in. It would kind of be murder, wouldn't it? However, all of those different Arnolds were kind of killing each other, especially if anyone had even a minor genetic flaw. So there would have been recently deceased ones, which perhaps could have been revived. If they were already brain dead, you're not killing anyone to put Arnold in. Just a thought. So there was an opportunity that Arnold didn't take when there were thousands, perhaps even millions of donors that he could have put his mind into and got an exact clone of his original body. Another really obvious example you might already be thinking of and screaming at the screen, Series 4's DNA. When it had that DNA machine, it's even implied in the episode that Arnold is thinking along the same lines that he could create a flesh and blood body for himself using the DNA machine. He's trying to do it with a piece of dandruff, although the joke in there is that the cat sneezes and loses the piece of dandruff, so loses Arnold's original DNA. However, Yes, okay, so Arnold probably couldn't have remade his own original body using a DNA machine, but he could easily have made anyone else's body. He could have got any, literally any bit of DNA from the entire ship of any of the old dead crew, made their body and put his mind into it, because just making someone's body from the DNA shouldn't fill it with memories. Although the much later episode Cured kind of implies that maybe DNA would carry memories. But anyway, he could have remade a body using a DNA machine, with DNA from any dead crew member, or if you want to make things really simple, you just clone the cat or Lister. They're there, they're alive, you can easily get a blood sample or a DNA sample. Just clone one of them, surely that's the simplest. And finally, now this one perhaps could be seen as a, the most in sort of insidious, a bit kind of the most murderous if you like. Series 3's time slides gave Arnold plenty of opportunities to kind of grab a living person and put his mind in. It was implied very strongly that from the throwing of a snowball and from the stealing of a briefcase, that stuff could pass two ways through the time slides photographs. So they could have, in theory, grabbed someone, put them aboard Red Dwarf, performed a mind swap and put them back. Yes, you would be murdering that person, but you'd be putting yourself back in time through the photograph. Would it work? Would it put you back in time? Or would you be stuck in the confines of the photograph, even though that body, that person originally came from the photo? It's a tricky question to answer. But yes, you could very much just grab someone, effectively murder them and put your mind in. And there you are, bam, you're back on Earth, back at whatever time period you got a photo of. But there is one other way that you could go back in time using time slides that doesn't seem so insidious and doesn't seem to murder anyone, doesn't have nearly as many moral consequences, you put your, your mind yourself into your younger self. Rimmer could have done this easily. In fact, he meets his younger self in one of the time slides. He could easily have grabbed that young boy he meets, put his mind in, and there you go. He's reborn away from Red Dwarf back three million years when he was a young lad, but with the mind and the memories of someone who's about 30. An interesting thought. You're kind of killing the young boy, but the young boy is you? Mm, morally, a bit of a weird one. Kind of an impossible one, but very interesting to think about. Or he could have found himself another photograph, perhaps one of him just before Red Dwarf set off on its voyage, so he could really have avoided the radiation leak. Interesting thoughts. In fact, Crichton and Lister could even have done the same thing as well, found old photographs of themselves, 
gone back and put their minds into their old selves before the radiation leak and never get stuck in deep space. But, but there are some massive paradoxes associated with this method of reincarnation, rebirth, remaking, whatever we want to call it. There are some massive paradoxes involved as not only would you never be inspired in the future to go back and put your mind in, but also where would that future version of your mind even come from if you went back in time and prevented yourself ever being involved in the accident and ever being stuck three million years in the future. Massive paradoxes, so perhaps that's why they never did it, but certainly an interesting thought that Rimmer, or any of them, could have kind of rebirthed themselves back in the past. So there you go, good people. There's my five ways that Rimmer could have been reborn, remade, recreated, in a flesh and blood body during the run of Red Dwarf episodes that come after the episode body swap. Let me know if my five are kind of dumb or if any of them don't quite work for you, or let me know if there's something I missed. Was there other opportunities? Was there other times that he could have done just this? It's been 14 years since Back to Earth hit our screens, but I watched it recently and came up with a theory that maybe Doug Naylor has had us all looking in the wrong direction when it comes to Back to Earth. So if you think you've got the whole meta, squid ink, hallucination thing figured out, then you need to hear this. Well, greetings, fellow dwarfers. Back to Earth was a fascinating free part of which saw the boys wind up on Earth then eventually wake up back on Red Dwarf, having realised the whole thing was a hallucination brought on by an encounter with hallucinogenic squid ink. Now it's made pretty explicit when exactly that hallucination was meant to have begun. It was right after the boys exit the diving bell and just before Katerina Bartokowski shows up. Or was it? You see there are a few clues which have got me wondering if there's more going on than first meets the eye and may imply that the boys were in the hallucination before the diving bell scene perhaps long, long before it. One of the most prominent clues is early in the first episode where the cat quite literally drops in on Lister whilst he's grieving over Kachansky in the Memorial Garden Observation Dome. What happened to you? You got a minute? The cat seems to drop down directly from the floor above, implying that he's come down from where the G-Deck water tank is located, given that he's still dripping wet, except look closer. There's no floor above Lister at this point, there's nothing but glass and the vast, cold emptiness of space. So unless we're meant to believe that the cat has managed to do a Spider-Man across the glass roof, then it's not illogical to wonder if he's got there in a more impossible way, implying that we might perhaps already be within the group hallucination where dreams can come true. That's a cheesy way to put it. Then about quarter of an hour into the first episode, the boys get into a fight with the squid and end up covered in pink goo, with Rimmer getting a good splash as well when Lister hurls a tentacle at him. The idea here is that like back in series five's Back to Reality, love this t-shirt, the boys have come into contact with the spare squid or rather joy squid ink, sparking their group hallucination a few moments later. But there's a problem here, as I see it, that pink goo isn't squid ink, it's squid blood. Let's take a look. The boys fight with the tentacles, but there's no obvious pink goo to see, and they don't seem to get sprayed or covered in ink. And we don't actually see any pink stuff until they exit the diving bell covered in pink goo. Okay, maybe it's just me and I'm just misreading things, but that looks like pink blood to me, particularly with Lister carrying a couple of detached tentacles with a messy knife between his teeth. Yes, I did have to film that a few times to say tentacles, not testicles, just like the cat did. If testicle shoots up out of the water and grabs me by the throat, he means tentacle. Plus, when we look at Series 5's Back to Reality, we see, or rather, we don't see any bright pink goo when Lister puts his glove into squid ink. The ink is black, which actually far more closely resembles the black ink we see from real world sea creatures. But possibly the most convincing and compelling argument of all, the most earth-shattering, my theory-hinging element, the most important thing you need to pick up on. When the cat came to talk to Lister about being attacked by the squid, he didn't stop to fix his hair first. Smeg, he didn't even have it sorted by the time he got to the sleeping quarters. Now, if that doesn't make you sceptical, well, frankly, I don't know what will. Okay, so all this leads to the inevitable question. Just what was going on then? Well, we have to remember that the squid is in the ship's water supply, so the crew could have been contaminated with ink at any time, 
by simply drinking or washing in contaminated water. So here are a few possibilities. Firstly, the possibility with the least effect on the Red Dwarf timeline would be if they've been in the hallucination since only a few hours or days before Back to Earth Part 1 began. Lister even mentions early on that they're down to their last water tank with only G-Deck left, implying that the switch to the G-Deck tank was a recent thing which may have brought with it squid ink contamination if you see G-Deck tank as isolated from the others. Then there's a possibility which would really screw with the continuity and history of the show. Perhaps they've been in a hallucination ever since they returned to Red Dwarf at the end of Series 7. It would explain why the ship changes from the short version at the end of Nanarchy to be in the long version at the beginning of Back in the Red Part 1, even though that's supposed to be the exact same moment in time. This could mean that the whole of Series 8 is within a dream. Kind of interesting, and it would explain why we have a living Rimmer at the end of Series 8 and a hologram version by the time we get to Back to Earth. And finally, there's a possibility that really messes with my head, as well as totally screwing up pre and possibly post Back to Earth canon. What if there never was a second squid and they're still in the original Back to Reality dream and they never left even though they thought they'd exited? This isn't actually as bonkers as you might think, given that there's a precedent for this within Red Dwarf, with Series 2's Better Than Life having the crew apparently return to reality, only to discover, much to Rimmer's dismay, that they're still trapped in the dream. Also, the book Better Than Life did a very similar thing as well. We could really push this theory out in many different directions and try and work out how much of the show would be missing then, Series 6, Series 7, Series 8, and it could even mean that the stuff after Back to Earth, they could still be in a dream. So series 10, 11, 12 and the Promised Land, all Dave era, could still be within a hallucination. Very interesting. This could actually bring with it a fun little possibility that some of the other characters within Back to Reality and Back to Earth could actually be real world people who were also caught up in the same hallucination. Perhaps there were some others trapped on the Esperanto who'd come into contact with the ink, it could be great fun to have Andy appear alive in some future episode. How about Noddy? How about the know-it-all, know-nothing idiot Mike Mellington? Katerina? How about the kids on the bus? There's so many possibilities. So what do you guys think? Was Doug Naylor pulling a bit of a Christopher Nolan with Dreams Within Dreams? Did Back to Earth not go down anywhere near like how we all first thought? And could the boys still be dreaming even years later with the whole of the Dave era possibly all being within a hallucination? Let me know your thoughts down below. Personally, I'm leaning towards the second one where maybe Series 8 didn't happen. George McIntyre should be known as the forgotten radiation leak survivor, but could this guy have a more sinister side. Could he have wiped out the entire crew? George McIntyre was a hologram that we met in the very first episode for about 30 seconds. But I've managed to come up with four quick theories that might completely change how you look at this guy and really change how important he is to the Red Dwarf timeline. Plus, I've got one bonus theory that you want to stick around for. Theory number one. When Rimmer went to join the Enlightenment crew in Holoship, Captain Aircool Platini said, that the only way to join the crew was through Dead Man's Boots. The only way in is Dead Man's Boots. Meaning that one crew member was going to have to get deleted or effectively killed in order for Rimmer to join. But this isn't the first time that Rimmer got to be revived as a hologram through Dead Man's Boots. When the radiation leak swept through Red Dwarf three million years earlier and took out all of the living crew members, there was no reason whatsoever that anything would happen to George McIntyre he wouldn't even get knocked off his feet. There's no logical reason why George McIntyre wouldn't be the radiation leak survivor along with Lister, who was down in stasis. But then when Rimmer was brought back as a hologram, Holly must have made a conscious decision to turn off or to not turn back on George McIntyre. So Rimmer's already come back through Dead Man's Boots once already on Red Dwarf, and then he wants to do it a second time on the Enlightenment. So it's just another great little insight into the psyche of Rimmer, that he can have such a victim mentality about his death, resurrection and hologrammatic status, even though, as the second lowest ranked person on the ship, he had absolutely no right to be resurrected at all. And in fact, there was already an active hologram, George McIntyre, who had to be wiped out to give Rimmer his place. So this is a really interesting insight into Rimmer's psyche that he can still have that victim mentality despite all that he's been given. Quick theory number two. 
the Ganymedian Mafia is who caused the radiation leak and wiped out the crew. Let me quickly explain for those who might not know what I'm on about. If you read the book Infinity Welcomes Careful Drivers, there's a whole section in there about George McIntyre. We get much more of his backstory, it's really quite cool, you get to see uh, what led him up to dying in the first place. In the book, it's because he shot himself. The reason being, he had massive gambling debts owed to the Ganymedian Mafia who keep coming after him. Now, the book says that he was actually really happy to be revived as a hologram and he's really pleased about it because it solves all of his problems as he can now live a new life as a hologram because dead people can't owe debts. But what if the Ganymedian Mafia wanted to make a point that even death isn't a way to escape them? What if they want to say that death doesn't release you from your debt? Perhaps the Ganymedian Mafia are the guys who arranged or sabotaged the ship in order to wipe out the whole crew, which would perhaps then provoke Holly to switch off George McIntyre, which seems to be what happened, and really prove the point that even death doesn't get you away from the Mafia. So perhaps the radiation leak had nothing really to do with Rimmer at all, and it was always going to happen because of sabotage. In fact, Lister's words in The Promised Land sort of agree with that. He said, you didn't question the order to repair an unrepairable drive plate. That's because you didn't question the order to repair an unrepairable drive plate. So it wasn't that he misrepaired it, it was unrepairable, which could imply sabotage. Quick theory number three. What if George McIntyre dying and being revived as a hologram, what if that is what led to the radiation leak? Not on purpose, just by accident because of something he forgot. Presumably, whenever somebody is revived as a hologram in the Red Dwarf universe, there's always gonna be a memory gap from whenever it was they were last backed up, whenever they last saved their mind, to the point when they died. Perhaps a big gap for non-essential crew like Lister and Rimmer, or a shorter gap for senior officers, perhaps they back up their minds once a month or something. But regardless, there's always gonna be some sort of gap. So what if, while George McIntyre was still alive, he had on his to-do list to sort out the drive plate, or at least report it, but then he died, it all got forgotten about, you get revived as a hologram, but from a backup that was at least, I don't know, a few weeks, a few months old, and suddenly he's got no memory of the drive plate issue, leading to the crew, just assigning it to Rimmer, thinking that there was nothing out of the ordinary. So it might be that George McIntyre dying is what causes the radiation leak, not deliberately, but just by him forgetting that there was ever a problem in the first place. So perhaps when Rimmer skipped from reality to reality in the episode Skipper, and it comes to the reality where everything seemed hunky-dory, everything seems fine, there hadn't been a radiation leak and everyone's about 30 years older. So maybe in that reality, George McIntyre hadn't died 30 years earlier. Maybe he died at the very start of that day or a few days earlier because the radiation leak suddenly happens. It could be that George McIntyre's death is like a Doctor Who style set point in time that triggers the radiation leak in each and every reality. Whenever it is that George McIntyre dies, the radiation leak follows soon after. This could actually be something that could be really cool to look at in the upcoming Red Dwarf Titan show. Perhaps their mission is to make sure that George McIntyre does die in order to cause the radiation leak to happen to make sure that Lister can then go on to be the last human being and keep the human race going. That's a fun thought. Quick theory number four about George McIntyre. What if there was no accident, but it was deliberate sabotage by George McIntyre? He meant for there to be a radiation leak and kill everyone. What if his words at his welcome back party weren't a joke at all? What if he meant it? My advice to anyone more vital to the mission than me is, if you die, I'll kill you. <laughs> if you die, I'll kill you. I'll kill you. I'll kill you. I'll kill you. <laughs> what if he wasn't joking? What if this guy had gone proper loopy and he meant it? Maybe he wants to try and prevent anyone more senior than him taking his place as the ship's hologram, so decides that if he just wipes out everyone, he reckons that Holly will just let him continue on living as they don't need anyone more senior, there's no mission left. Perhaps in the TV version, he isn't happy about being a hologram, unlike the book where he's really happy. Perhaps in the TV, he's really unhappy about it, resents everybody else for living, so finds a way to kill everyone? So maybe he meant it, maybe he caused the radiation leak. Sure, he can't touch things as a hologram, but he could have got a scutter to do it. Maybe he just gave bad orders. Maybe it was him that gave the order to send Rimmer, the worst technician on the ship, to send Rimmer to go and repair 
the drive plate with George knowing that it was unrepairable. So my quick bonus theory, kind of a bonus thought. In Series 8, when the crew was resurrected by the nanobots, would they have resurrected George McIntyre as a living person or as a hologram again? I think he would have been as a hologram again because, firstly, Holly can only sustain one hologram, but it isn't Rimmer this time. Rimmer's living in Series 8, so that's not a problem. But secondly, and more significantly, back in the very first episode, Hollister flushed George McIntyre's ashes out into space back in our solar system three million years earlier. So I don't think the nanobots would have had any access to his ashes and had no physical reference, if you like, for George McIntyre. But given that they broke down and rebuilt the ship, they should have found his data disk that Rimmer would have hid back in the first series sometime. They would have found his data disk and been able to reboot him as a hologram. So I reckon George McIntyre is somewhere on that huge Series 8 ship walking around as a hologram. Red Dwarf.